Olympus have supported my photography since 1998 and during that time I have been privileged to witness at close quarters the advent and development of their digital cameras, culminating in Micro Four Thirds. This review features the OMD EM1 Mark II camera. Most images have been captured with the Zuiko 12 to 100 Pro lens, a superlative optic in my opinion. With one exception to be mentioned later, I have not used any other hardware, filters or a tripod. I handhold everything courtesy of two stout legs which I regret to say are not suitable for public exhibition. When taking a shot I compose myself and hold my breath. I don't faff about, I work spontaneously. I know precisely what I want. Much of my success relies on 60 years experience. This cannot be taught. Practice makes perfect, my music teacher kept telling me, and that advice applies here. But I failed pianoforte playing. I saved a RAW in 4x3 format, cataloguing all images individually with the precise location. I only digitally process production photographs in Adobe Lightroom, make a 1400 pixel width JPEG copy and crop to 16x9 for YouTube. I have established a workflow from start to finish and my images are taken with Lightroom post-production in mind. Change just one element and I start again. However, at the end of the day, even with photo technique oozing from my fingertips, landscapes still need the right sort of sun. I am not a real photographer. I did consider it, but found the queue too long. Far better to be a one-off and establish your own style. But above all, don't copy me be yourself and no one else. Nevertheless, I will show a selection of images taken in 2018. And I will mention technique, but you pick and choose. I live within easy reach of the South Downs. It was January, the sun low in the sky. Clarity was excellent for distant views, but I was captivated by the light and shade in every fold of the downs, patterns enhanced by a westering sun. I don't have to wait for the golden hour in winter. You have it for much of the time, and anyway, it is dark after four, by which time I could be enjoying the high life in Brighton. I accompanied my brother and his wife to Guildford, but suffered one of those days where you just end up in the coffee shop, except for one brief moment. The cathedral caught for a fleeting moment by an isolated, yes, just one ray of sunlight. And that was it for the rest of the day, I'm afraid. Hampstead Garden Suburb has a fantastic church designed by Lutyens. If it was located in Westminster, it would be a major tourist attraction, but at Hampstead, the vicar had to unlock the church. Because of the absence of nearby roads, it is used as a recording studio for classical music recordings by Hyperion Records, which one can see, or should I say, hear. But be warned, there are no shops or a pub to retreat to, just a central square seemingly devoid of life, but then it was still January. Into February and my first major photo shoot, the Y Valley. No one sent me, it was sheer indulgence to lift the winter gloom and I was lucky with weather. I stayed at Chepstow and walked off a Long Distance Path for fun to 
Tinton Abbey and got the bus back, which I had to pay for because I only had an English bus pass. I arrived later than planned. Well, it was a long walk, but luck was on my side. The very low light adding a touch of magic to the Abbey's architecture. I spot metered off highlights, allowing shadows to be rendered underexposed and then corrected in laterum. Has it worked? Well, you judge by the result and not the technique. I had a meeting to attend at Church Stretton, stayed an extra night and then teamed up with my Shropshire friend Liz Carr. Liz knows the county like the back of her hand and took me to a number of noteworthy locations, some off the beaten track. Although the date was written in stone, we were fortunate with the weather, the views enhanced by a sprinkling of snow, but at Stiperstone's and Mitchell's Fold we suffered for our art. I escaped the worst of the cold weather at Huendon Manor, Disraeli's home near High Wycombe, but a church at Meerworth in Kent that had often intrigued me from a distance because of its Baroque tower lived up to its promise. I am not a churchgoer, but I find church architecture fascinating and challenging photographic subjects and there is more to follow. My first photographic contract for HF Holidays was in the Peak District. It was based at their hotel at Thorpe, not far from Dovedale, which can still get busy in early March. The weather was fickle and finding suitable subjects at the right time was challenging. The hill behind the hotel was a saving grace, especially at dawn, and whilst our walk across Chatsworth Park was pleasant, the church at Ensor sported a permanent incumbent. On my day off I visited the World of Wedgwood near Stoke-on-Trent, a fascinating diversion. March and early spring were not even hinting at the hot June around the corner. I had arranged a Lake District short break for members of the Dorking Camera Club and we stayed at a hotel that bordered Derwentwater. It faced east, therefore ideal for sunrise photography, just a few short steps from our bedrooms. Some even brought their morning cuppa to the shoot. We visited several lakes, including some dramatic light at Coniston Water. Timing is extremely important in my work, and not just weather. Places like Blenheim Palace get busy at the best of times, particularly when you are sharing the day with two school parties. Problems solved by touring the house first, and then waiting for exterior shots interspersed by lunch. Isn't it uncanny how crowds melt away after five o'clock? Capability Brown landscaped the grounds at Blenheim, and as I was currently engaged in preparing a short AV lecture about his work, a visit was essential. Shortly afterwards I went with Olympus friends John and Sheila Smale to Fence Stanton in Cambridgeshire. Capability Brown had purchased a manor house in the village for his retirement. Unfortunately he died prematurely and quite suddenly before he could take up residence. He is buried in the churchyard.
Next, a day trip to Hever Castle with Pat, another Olympus photographer. We patiently waited for the classic shot without people. Then it was off for a ride on a steam railway, not one, but two. This was an organised holiday for HF that featured the Bluebell Railway and Watercrest Line. When running any programmed holiday, research is just as important as taking pictures. Therefore, I quickly dashed up to Hlangothlan to check their railway for a later holiday. I stayed overnight, finding time to visit the ruined castle at the top of Kastath Dinas Bran. I have published a separate YouTube program about this aspect of the trip. I have mentioned about working with light, which is easier to do on your own. It clouded over at Frankothlan on the second day, taking the oomph out of the shots. All change, as I was returning home from Chester, I made time to visit the cathedral. Away from hills, the light returned, and I was intrigued by the highly coloured Great West Window installed in 1961. Courtesy of the Almighty, it projected rays of coloured hues onto the stone floor. Another touch of magic to finish a memorable two-day break that sticks in the memory today. Olympus loaned their new 17mm f1.2 prime optic. Although intended for portraiture, I was keen to test its low-light capabilities by taking it to St Albans and Lichfield cathedrals. A cloudy day at St Albans brought out all the detail in the architecture, where one can capture the skills of the medieval master masons. At Lichfield, the sun added its own mystique, giving different photographic challenges, not least controlling contrast. Being an f1.2 optic, all shots are handheld, and again, there is a separate YouTube program available on my site. That hot and prolonged heat wave was just around the corner. So, relying on the forecast, I very quickly sneaked in a local walk from East Grinstead, where I reacquainted myself, albeit rather briefly, with the Blue Bell Railway again at Kingscote. But it wasn't long before our green and pleasant land lost its edge, forcing an entirely different challenge on finding the right landscape. That was soon put to the test in South Wales, which wasn't so badly affected as the South East, but waterfalls were out of the question. The holiday was based at Bracken, in the school holidays, so it was uh, rather busy. That challenge was strained at Hrangors Lake, but I found a quiet spot. Gower was a near disaster, but I redeemed myself by adding Dinavor Park in place of a waterfall. A fuller account of this holiday is found on YouTube, including Kumyoi Church, where your eyes do not deceive you, and I am not taking wonky pictures. Anyway, my viewfinder has the ultimate senior citizen aid, a spirit level. Fortunately, steam trains do not demand a green and pleasant land. I hosted an event day on the Bluebell Railway for Olympus, with the valuable help from their technical team. Whilst much of my time was taken up with assisting others, I did manage to sneak in a couple of character shots of railway staff. The landscape took time to recover, so jaunts into open country were limited. However, 
St. Paul's Cathedral in London, where photography is not permitted, opened its doors every Thursday in August for photographers. Something together with John and Sheila I took advantage of for another future AV project. By now I was back to the 12 to 100 Pro lens, a fantastic optic in all respects. F4 is the widest aperture, but constant over an 8.5 times optical zoom range. It also has its own image stabilizer that is used in tandem with the camera stabilizer, making hand holding at 200 ISO a distinct possibility. The shutter speed was a sixth of a second, but look at the detail. The trick, of course, is to hold your breath. Again, I have published a separate YouTube film about this photo shoot. Fortunately, most of my photographic holidays for HF were in autumn. By then, the landscape had recovered. Back in the Peak District, I offered something a little different. A railway line without trains. As part of its route, the former Midland Railway made a beeline for Manchester through the Peak District. Now closed, it is a walkway and cycle track, and added to the adventure are the tunnels, which have been restored. Real trains come to the fore in Wales, but of the smaller variety at Talathrin. Over three days, a full house of train photographers enjoyed rides on the Llangothlan Railway, Festiniog, as well as Talathrin. On the way, we stopped off for a scenic feature, such as Dolgoch Falls, but at Festiniog, our plans were hampered by torrential rain, but with hardly a complaint after a very hot, dry summer. Another themed photographic holiday took place at Lulworth Cove. Although works of fiction, the novels of Thomas Hardy are based on real landscapes. Only the names are changed and sometimes to protect the true location. Nevertheless, I featured some, but an added bonus to the holiday were sunrise shots at the cove, a short distance away from the hotel. They were not planned, but I'd like to give my photographers value for money. I do like occasional mad trips on the trains by booking cheap advance first-class tickets weeks ahead, leaving weather to lady luck. Immediately after Lulworth, I sped up to Manchester, stayed overnight quite close to New Mills, and then walked up Kinder Scout, just over 2,000 feet above sea level. It was an impulsive trip for masochistic pleasure, something I hadn't done since the 1980s, by taking a route that finished in Edo. It was a fantastic day, what luck! but I was glad to freshen up in the first-class lounge at Manchester Piccadilly, followed by celebratory wine with my meal on the train back home. Following an enjoyable overnight stay with Richard and Ross, plus a visit to Scotney Castle that proved to be another example of avoiding people, I hosted my second event day for Olympus, this time at Ely Cathedral. Limited to just 20 photographers, the day included access to the Octagon Tower that certainly put a different perspective on proceedings. A few days beforehand, I had travelled to Ely to check matters, but after consulting the weather forecast, I managed some spectacular sunset shots across Ely Country Park, where everything just fell into place. Another AV project in the planning stage is End of the Line. Railway routes closed due to the beaching acts, but now enjoying a different existence. Heritage railways and footpaths are common, but 
unique in Cambridgeshire is a guided busway between Cambridge and St Ives, following the route of the former railway. The route can only be used by modified buses running on a dedicated trackway, now grassed over but fully functional. The maximum speed is 58 miles per hour, and once on the trackway, the driver does not have to steer the bus. Just apply the brakes when required. By now it was time for a rest, but of course the phone rings and everything changes. Another photography leader for HF Holidays had been taken ill, so with just three days' notice I took his place. It was based at Sedba, covering the Yorkshire Dales and Lake District, places I know well. The weather was kind, but one, one of the best locations was Scout Scar near Kendal, and you can learn more about this amazing place on YouTube. The weather was not so generous for my last photo holiday in Shropshire, so Plan B swung into action. With gritted teeth I stuck with as much of the itinerary that was practical, but after the holiday I met up with Liz again, and relying on her expertise she took me to some intriguing locations in North Shropshire, quite close to the Welsh border. Other than a day trip to Winkworth Arboretum to help a friend who had just purchased an EM1 Mark II, I did my final mad trip on a train, first class of course, this time to York. The intention was to visit the National Railway Museum, but with time to kill I took some shots of York City Centre at night. I produced a YouTube film, which has been my most successful in audience numbers and reactions. It was like composing a hit tune. As mentioned at the beginning, all images in this production have been created with the absolute minimum of gear. Less is more. It focuses the mind something I learned in the 80s and 90s with a Hasselblad 500cm with just one lens. Then the best zoom lens were your legs, but not perhaps on a mountain top, but it still made me think. For me, extra gear gets in the way of creative photography. Therefore I use just one camera of the highest quality plus a basic Yes, just basic knowledge of Lightroom and Photoshop. For landscape and architecture, it is still the seeing eye that creates the picture, but at the mercy of the right sort of sun. <laughs>